Coming up on DTNS, who is a modular gaming PC for? Rob Dunwood shares some tips for good home video and AI gets better at rap battles. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, December 4th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And from Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. And I'm the show's producer, Roger. We were uh, just talking about glasses and proper screen management with glasses, uh, as well as uh, TikTok and TV shows and more on Good Day Internet. Get that wider show. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. If you live in Nashville, Tennessee, or Huntsville, Alabama, you can now sign up for Google Fiber's two gigabit per second fiber internet service. That's two gigs down, but still only one gig up. It's still very fast. The plan costs $100 a month and includes a Wi-Fi 6 multi-gig router, tri-band mesh extender, and installation. The Wi-Fi router supports two gig speeds with Wi-Fi 6 devices, and the multi-gig router has a 10 gigabit per second port, though you may need adapters at both ends to get wired two gigabyte speed. The journal Science published a paper from researchers at the University of Science and Technology of China in Hefei claiming to have achieved quantum supremacy, the ability to do a problem significantly faster than a non-quantum system. The system is called Zhushang, completed in just more than three minutes, a complex statistical test that would take the Sunway Taihu Light supercomputer more than two billion years to complete. Zhuzhang uses photons traveling through optical circuits laid out on a lab bench guided by mirrors. The settings for the problem were effectively hard-coded into the optical circuits that make it difficult to reprogram for other uses, but it did it. This is the first claim of quantum supremacy since Google in October 2019. The Wall Street Journal sources say that the U.S. Department of Justice is discussing a deal to allow Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou to return to China from Vancouver, Canada, in exchange for admitting wrongdoing. Meng has been on bail in Vancouver wearing an ankle monitor since December 5, 2018, after the U.S. requested her extradition on charges that she lied to banks about Huawei's business ties to Iran. A, a few more details came out around Google's former co-head of AI ethics, Timnit Gebru, no longer being at the company. We talked about that a little length yesterday. Uh, we mentioned that Gebru said that she had been fired over her stance on a paper. Google is characterizing it as a resignation. The paper, we now know, examined potential bias in a large-scale language model. Google's head of AI, Jeff Dean, said the paper didn't take into account recent research to mitigate the risk of bias and blocked the paper from publication. Dean said Gebru wanted to know who all had reviewed the paper and their exact feedback, and if she didn't get that, she would set an end date for employment, and Dean now says that means Gebru resigned. The U.S. Department of Defense added SMIC, China's largest chipmaker, to a list of alleged Chinese military companies. While the list itself doesn't carry direct penalties from the U.S., a recent executive order will prevent U.S. investors from buying securities from listed companies in late 2021. In September, the U.S. Commerce Department began informing some U.S. companies that they would need to acquire licenses before supplying goods or services to SMIC, citing unacceptable risk that equipment could be used for military purposes. All right, let's talk a little bit more about good news for your phone use on a plane, Rob. Oh, man. So, so after seven years of contemplation, the FCC decided that allowing passengers to make phone calls on planes is still a horrible, horrible idea, and it will <laughs> not remove the ban currently in place. Back in 2013, the FCC proposed removing a ban, and it has taken them until today, actually, um, to say, nah, we're good, we're not doing that. And uh, the decision um, is strongly based on uh, strong opposition from pilots and flight attendants. Um, you know, the, there's a lot of safety concerns that they say. A lot of it is probably just they want to cut down on the flights for people saying you're talking too loud because I, mm -hmm. I can just see I can see fist fights coming from long flights from, let's say, like D.C. to L.A. to where somebody oh, is just talking loud the whole time. And it, it gets to the point to where fisticuffs are thrown. So. Well, this and is, there's uh, that whole thing about when someone's having a one-sided conversation, it's more annoying than when two people are talking to each other because you're sort of fixated on what that other person that's silent might be saying. And yeah, it's, it, you know, think of being on a red eye and, you know, everyone kind of, you know, trying to maybe sleep if you can, maybe you don't, but you're quiet. 
if I get a phone call and I'm, you know, chatting loudly with my mom next to somebody who's trying to get a little shut eye, they should be mad at me. I also I'm forgot. I already that this don't was like it thing. when people chat too much with the person next to them behind me, right? Like just, just keep it low. Keep it Yeah, keep it low or 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 I don't know. Yeah. Be be a quiet texture. I had forgotten that this was even something that was being contemplated, mm-hmm. probably mm-hmm. because I haven't been on a plane in a while and I don't plan to anytime soon. So it's sort of like, uh, I don't know, whatever they ruled doesn't have anything directly to do with me these days. But yeah, uh, I'm glad that I don't have to power off all my devices when a plane takes off or lands uh, the way that we used to. And, you know, a lot of people were like, but why? <laughs> why do we have to do that? And you know, FAA was like, OK, you don't really anymore. Yeah. But uh, yeah, talking on the phone, mm, no go. I'm happy. I, I remember when they were thinking about this or when they started thinking about it, because I was flying probably five, six times a month. And it was it would have just made my life miserable if I had to listen to a plane full of people chat, you know, chatting for hours at a time. So I'm glad they yeah. decided not to do this. Well, speaking of things we haven't done in a long time, I want you to think back to a long time in the past. <laughs> January. Oh my gosh. Remember January? <laughs> CES. Uh, Razer, if you recall, was showing off another modular gaming PC system back then. We talked about it on DTNS. Well, just under the wire to avoid being vaporware, Razer announced the Tomahawk, a case that comes with two PCIe slots, one for a GPU and the other for an Intel NUC element. The 210 millimeter by 365 millimeter by 150 millimeter metal chassis is 10 liters in capacity, comes with a 750 watt PSU, uses active cooling, four USB-A 3.2 ports, two Thunderbolt USB-C 3 ports, two, I'm sorry, they're USB-C Thunderbolt 3 ports, two gigabit Ethernet ports, onboard Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.0, and even a 3.5 millimeter jack. The case is matte black aluminum with dual-sided detachable glass doors and chroma RGB lights at the bottom to do some fun light-up stuff. The NUC module itself contains a 45-watt core i9-9980HK Coffee Lake processor, 16 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM, 512 gigabytes of NVMe solid-state drive, as well as a 2-terabyte hard drive. You can upgrade the NUX memory and storage, but not the CPU. The way you update a CPU in this case is you get a different NUC. So if Intel makes some more that are compatible here, you'll be able to do that. Uh, you can use a variety of full-size GPUs, and Razer will sell the Tomahawk to you two ways. They both come with the NUC, but you can order the Tomahawk without a GPU and bring your own, or you can order it with an NVIDIA RTX 3080 Founders Edition pre-installed. Now, the Tomahawk is $2,400 if you don't get a GPU with it. It's $3,200 with the RTX 3080. And if you're thinking, oh, maybe this is my way to get an RTX 3080, well, the pre-orders are open in the U.S., but it's already out of stock. Uh, so uh, good luck getting one of these. I think a lot of people think this is cool technology. It makes it easier for you to plug and play and swap and upgrade you know, to a new GPU and a new GPU comes out. But Rob... It seems like a pretty narrow difference between the people who want to DIY and build themselves and and people who just want to buy an off-the-shelf machine. Yeah, I I hate to be that old guy that says, uh, you know, just wants to poo-poo everything. Because in in essence, this sounds cool, but I don't know what business critical issue this is solving for me. Um, Mm -hmm. I am someone, I don't build PCs today, but I did back in the day. And one of the biggest reasons that I built, you know, there were two main reasons that I built my own PCs. One, cost. You know, you could build something significantly less expensively than it would have cost to buy it, uh, you know, pre-built. Um, and two, oftentimes you wanted to have the bleeding edge, so you literally need to, you know, you needed to have the ability to pull something out and then put something else in to get your machine to be the fastest on the block. This doesn't really do either of those things. It's, uh, you know, like for the person that's like, well, I want to build, but I don't really want to build. I I guess it's for them, but you're not saving money and you're not necessarily going to have the best of breed. So like I said, for me, it's cool technology, but I don't know that that, that there's a use case for, you know, for someone like myself. Yeah. It's a good, you gotta be for somebody who has enough money 
that they just don't want to go to the trouble of unscrewing the case. <laughs> like that's that's a pretty narrow slice, I think. Uh, Razer also announced the Hammerhead True Wireless Pro earbuds that feature active noise cancellation or THX certified and IPX4 rated for water resistance. The buds can reduce audio latency to 60 milliseconds when you're gaming. Hammerhead True Wireless Pro is available right now also for $200. All right. I like the look of those. All right. Thursday, Warner Media Studios announced all its 2021 films would go to HBO Max and theaters at the same time, and chaos ensued. Apparently, they did so without consulting the theaters themselves. AMC CEO Adam Aaron said in response to the announcement that, quote, Warner Media intends to sacrifice a considerable considerable portion of the profitability of its movie studio division to subsidize its HBO Max startup. And, quote, we will do all in our power to ensure that Warner does not do so at our expense. Regal Theatres owner Cineworld released a statement saying it plans to reopen cinemas in Q1 of 2021 and believes, quote, WB will look to reach an agreement about the proper window and terms that will work for both sides. Meanwhile, in an interview with the Washington Post, AT&T CEO John Stankey said that this could be a lifeline for theaters. He pointed out that once people go back to theaters, you may see all the studios release a bunch of movies at once, creating a bubble where the movies don't make as much as they would be expected to otherwise. Stankey also added that the company realized, quote, we're going to have some really good content here that's spoiling and can be used for other purposes. Huh. Yeah, uh, so so the the top line here is we were wondering yesterday when we talked about this, did the theaters sign on to this? And the answer is no. no. Uh, Warner, Warner Media is playing hardball, uh, just announcing this and making the theaters scramble to negotiate something later. Uh, it sounds like John Stanky is saying, look, theaters are going to get more money out of having us do this than they would if we just held up all our releases until 2022. Uh, and that, right, that seems yeah, to be the negotiating were, position yeah, of they're AT&T. Just sitting on movies, like theaters don't get anything out of that. They get nothing. Yeah, and I, I feel bad for the, uh, you know, you know, for the movie theaters as much as you can for corporations. I feel bad mm -hmm. for the people who are out, you know, who are displaced out of work. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, something, you know, the, the, these companies are not going to just sit on all this content and let it get stale and then not be able to make any money on it. So it's like, we're, you know, this is what we're going to do. And I just don't know that there's a lot that the uh, movie theaters are going to be able to do about it. I mean, they'll probably come to some type of an agreement, but, um, you know, for the next year or maybe even more than that, you know, movie theaters are just not going to, you know, be the place where people are going to watch content. Yeah, I, I, I do think uh, Warner has them over a barrel. Uh, I don't think it's impossible that maybe we end up with a couple of small windows. Uh, my best guess, though, is we're going to see revenue shares come out of this. We're going to see Cineworld AMC and, and whoever else uh, tries to negotiate getting a cut of some digital revenue the way they did with Wonder Woman. Uh, but it's going to be less of a cut because... Uh, Warner Media just went ahead and said, we're doing it, you know, so the horse is out of the barn. In fact, John Stanky said in his interview with the Washington Post, the horse is out of the barn. Like, this is this is not going back. Hey, folks, if you want to join in the conversation about this or anything else in our Discord, uh, you can do so by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Well, Rob's been putting a lot of work into his video setup and agreed to share some of the tricks he's learned and a few of the products he thinks are worth knowing about if you're setting up your video from home. What do you got for us, Rob? So like everyone else on Earth, I am doing a lot of video conferencing from the house. Um, and, you know, I, I discovered in a conversation with my dad, who happens to be a photographer, that I really looked horrible whenever I was doing my, my calls. Now, you know, I'm a, I'm a engineer that has been doing, you know, teleconferences for literally years since, since, since you've been able to do webinar type stuff online, I've been doing it, but you never really showed your face. You just showed your product. So it didn't matter what you looked like, but now that's really changed. You know, people want to see your face. They want to see, you know, make sure that you, you know, like, you know, that you're dressed at least the top half of your body. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was doing everything. Now, I, I was using a actual Logitech uh, camera, not using the camera on, on my laptop. But I didn't think about lights. Lights were the lights that I had, you know, you know, turn the light switch on, turn the lamp on, whatever was near me. 
But I started to play around with just, oh, well, if I put this light here or if I actually sit in front of the window as compared to sitting behind the window, I'll look a little better. And, you know, what I've done for my setup, because I'm actually building an office down in my basement since I'm going to be working from home uh, for the foreseeable future. And I said, OK, well, I need to get some artificial light down here. So instead of just buying lamps, let's actually buy purpose built lights to do this. So, you know, what I'm doing right now, I know I'm jumping a little across the screen because I am I've got this chroma key from Skype, uh, you know, you know, kind of not making me look as good as it can look. But in OBS. Setup I've got actually looks pretty good, and I'm using a hundred dollar set of lights. These are uh, Moon Dog, uh, you know, um, um, soft box lights that I bought. Now I'm in my basement. I have an enormous amount of room down here, so I'm able to use these giant light boxes that I'm able to light myself with a hair light and a key light, and I actually put a backlight on the background behind myself. But you don't have to go that, you know, um, you know, you know, big lights like this. You can also use small lights that you literally would just clamp to your uh, desk. A lot of people, first thing they say is, oh, I need to get a ring light. I wear glasses. Ring lights and glasses are not necessarily the way to go because you will see the ring light in your glasses. Yeah, story so of my I, life. <laughs> so I said, OK, well, I don't want to do that. I want to get at least, you know, a left light and a right light so I don't have the glare of my glasses uh, just being distracting. So, um, you know, I started to look and it's like, you know, newer, they, they make lights that, uh, I mean, you can get a couple of them for 50 bucks. It, literally, they're just desktop lights that you sit on your, uh, you know, on, on your desk and, um, you know, you, you get them positioned right. You can turn the heat up and down. They even have filters on them that you can change the color of the light if you choose to do so. And for 50 bucks, you can, you know, you can significantly increase how you look on camera. A lot of people think that I need to buy a better camera. That's rarely the case. You just need to have better light for the camera that you have. So I have been for the last probably three or four months because my dad called me out on it, trying to figure out how to, as inexpensively as I can, make the lighting better so that I actually look better when I'm doing, um, you know, teleconferencing and stuff like that, which I'm doing quite a bit of these days. Yeah, I'm using the the same newer. I think they're they're actually older <laughs> versions of newer, uh, but the N E E W E R here, uh, and they they work great, uh, and they're 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 nice and efficient, uh, inexpensive LEDs, so they don't use a lot of power, you, and they're adjustable, like you said. Uh, the Mount Dog stuff that you were talking about, though, those are those are big old box lights. You know, they're they're soft box lights. Uh, that, yeah. That's the kind of stuff people use for professional shoots. It is the kind of stuff that you use for, for professional shoots. Now, once again, my dad is a retired professional. Um, he is a retired professional, uh, uh, you know, uh, photographer. The the soft boxes that he uses are significantly more than what I've got here. I tried to keep the cost down to, mm -hmm. you know, the, all mm -hmm. I'm doing is just lighting myself while I'm doing a, you know, a webinar style call. So these lights literally, when, when I got them, they were a hundred bucks. I think the price has gone up a little bit now that they might be like a hundred and ten bucks. But, you know, the light that I'm getting right now, uh, you know, three point lighting, hundred and ten dollars. Like I said, you can get if you just need two desktop lights, you can get those for as little as 40 bucks, 41, 42 bucks. And if you want to go with the nice Elgato, like the key lights uh, that you can control with apps and all that kind of stuff, you can spend a little bit more. You can spend as much as two hundred dollars a light for a still a relatively low end or medium range light. But it's it, you know, the light is everything when it comes to doing video. It's not always the camera. In fact, it's probably rarely your camera as long as you have a camera that is not the one built into your laptop. If you if you yeah, if right. you actually got a like a Logitech camera or anything that you spent you know a hundred bucks on as far as a camera, those are going to do just fine for uh, you know for webinars and you know for go to meetings and for Zoom calls and all that kind of stuff. It's just get your light right and you'll look a lot better. I think no, a lot of times too. Oh, go ahead, Tom. No, no, no. I was just going to say those Elgatos, as as pricey as they are, they they really aren't that different from the newer's. It doesn't seem like. No, they they aren't. And like I said. Um, they have a application that you can control everything from within the app. So they, they get some stuff built into it. But like I said, for me, I was just trying to go as cheap as possible. And since I've got the space, I've got these giant 24 inch, uh, by, I think they're 24 by 28 inch uh, uh, soft boxes that cost me a hundred bucks. And, you know, like I said, the, the difference between what I look like now, I used to look like I was sitting in a dungeon. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, what I was going to say is I, I have the ring light uh, glasses issue, which is, you know, it's an ongoing saga, uh, but uh, which we'll, we'll figure it out eventually. But 
when I, because I'm in a garage right now, my studio Redwood, surprise, it's a garage. And I've got these fluorescent overhead lights that at first I was like, oh, they're awful, you know, it, horrible lighting. But I've actually learned to use them as kind of fill and backlights mm -hmm. mm -hmm. because I've got my ring light and I have it on a really um, a warm setting, which offsets that sort of fluorescent stuff. So, yeah, yeah. And, and you mentioned the window as well. You know, are you frequently near a window in the middle of the day? It's like you can use the light that you've already got and supplement it and, and turn out uh, with something that looks really nice. Right. You know, there's if, if we go back in the annals of shows that I've done, there were times when I was actually sitting in front of a window. My back was to the window and there was nothing I could do. I couldn't move my desk and I couldn't move the window. So I literally just took a plant and put it in front of the window to just diffuse the light a little bit. Mm -hmm. And if I remember, one of you guys asked me, like, Rob, did you get a new camera? It's like, no, I just changed the lighting a little bit. So I re it was me because I was like, it looks so good. So, uh, yeah, it's you know, just playing around, uh, you know, with your light, changing the angle of your desk, changing the angle of your light, you know, doing those little things. I mean, you, you got to play with it until you get it right for your situation where you're set up. But don't just go out and spend a thousand dollars on a camera and you still don't have a thousand dollars worth of lights because you're going to still look like, you know, not that great. You, you want to get your light right. Well, uh, Tom mentioned a rapping robot at the top of the show, so let's dive in, shall we? <laughs> music technologist <laughs> Gil Weinberg of the Georgia Institute of Technology has adapted a musical robot called Shimon to compose lyrics and then perform them in real time. Shimon can collaborate with people on compositions or even engage in rap battles, which is all the rage if you're on Instagram anyway. Shimon is believed to be the first robot capable of composing its own rap songs. Shimon can identify keywords in an opponent spoken lyrics and then generate new lyrics based around those original lyrics generated from custom data that sets Shimon has trained on using deep learning. Shimon is capable of rhyming by using a phoneme data set. Phonemes are distinct units of pronunciation that make up a word sound. So it kind of learns what you're doing and, and knows how to replicate it. To keep Shimon responding in real time, the response vocabulary was capped at 3,000 words and limiting the amount of time that it listens. So the robot can wrap a comeback in less than seven seconds. Shimon also improvises head gestures and eyebrow wiggles. And it's really darn cute. The solution is passing by. We are the servants of the world's for the world's showing aim. Cause you're trying to make a claim. I want to be a human. You want to be human, but you got to get a circulatory <laughs> system. That's a rap battle with Dash Smith uh, on the uh, the official YouTube for this. They say they made Shimon sound computery on purpose. Uh, which I think was because if they made if they gave it a more natural sounding artificial voice, it would it would be have even more of an uncanny valley. So they're like, we want to make it clear that right. it's it's a robot. Yeah. Rappers out of work everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I it, it's got a long way to go, but uh, and the video, the YouTube video, which we'll have in our show notes, is it's really cool because it is sort of this adorable, you know, robot kind of you know, uh, dab into the beat and. Um, what 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 can't we do? We 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 heard what it sounded like today. In three years, battle yeah. rappers they better watch out. <laughs> yeah, it's only going to get better. Yeah, versus in three years we'll be featuring Shimon against somebody. <laughs> gonna He's have doing some a hit. collab with someone. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, it's going to show up on my, on my iTunes or my uh, Apple Music, I should say. Uh, yeah, uh, and and as as goofy as that sounds uh, when we play it back, in some respects, it's impressive that that wasn't programmed, right? It's easy for you to go like, well, that's easy. I just you know type into any kind of speech synthesizer and make that happen. That was created on the fly. Like you really got to listen closely to the entire rap battle with Dash Smith to understand that it's taking things that Dash says. And incorporating right. them, Within you know, seconds. like there's there's some real semantic processing going on there, which is impressive. It's hard to do. Well, I've got a story that may make you laugh or cry, depending on who you are. Taiwan News reports that Taiwanese Facebook user Jin Wu says that he purchased a hard to get Sony PS5 from a reseller on November 20th from a woman who seemed to know little about gaming and was selling the PS5 for a particularly low price. When Wu arrived to collect the PS5. He was met by a middle-aged man who seemed to be an avid gamer. When we asked the man, why are you getting rid of the PS5? The man said, 
My wife wants to sell it. It turns out that women can tell the difference between a PS5 and an air filter. So the implication here is that his wife told him he couldn't buy a PS5, so he secretly somehow got a hold of a PS5 and told her it would try, or at least tried to tell her it was an air filter. That feels like he could have he could have thought a little more about that. <laughs> right. It's uh, the whole thing because she's probably looking at you know the receipt and being like, "Wait a second. No, he, you said it was an air filter." To, he might have been able to get away with giant Wi-Fi router. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, air filter. Wrong I mean, keep keep the receipt away from her. And she goes, "What is that?" And be like, "Oh yeah, that's just this is for a Wi-Fi router. That's a that's for our network." I just love yeah. the idea of these two men meeting each other somewhere and the guy saying, why are you doing this? And he's like, my wife made me. <laughs> well, <laughs> She's also, not even here right now. <laughs> she she clearly like made the sale. Like she was the one talking on the phone. Like, yeah, come and get it. I don't know anything about it, but you're going to you, you, I'm selling it for face value. I'm assuming she sold it for face value rather than profit. Uh, cause he said it was affordable. I can't imagine she sold it at a loss. That would obviate the whole point. Uh, but she made the husband give it up as I, I believe extra punishment for doing it. You give that man your PS five. <laughs> yeah. You look him in the <laughs> eye and hand it over. You tell him what you did. Ah, <laughs> oh, air filters. Good times. Yeah. I like, I did Rob, you're onto it. Something about Wi-Fi. something it's an internet appliance, internet of things. Yeah. When I first saw the design of it, it's grown on me to the point where I actually want one now, but it looked like a Wi-Fi router. It's like, man, it, it, mm -hmm. can that thing sit flush? Yeah, I mean, does. it just, it just looked a little weird. It's like, you know, you just need to throw some antennas on it or something like that. It would be a giant <laughs> Wi-Fi router. And then she's like, I'm doing some trace routes on this new router, and it's throwing some really odd packets, honey. <laughs> we need to talk about this. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. So Martin wrote in and had an interesting story about, you know, movie theaters versus the option of watching at home and the more options that we have now. Martin says he and his fiance each had a Cineworld Unlimited membership. They're in the UK, I believe. And Martin says they'd make a trip once or twice a month and they'd see four to six films in a single day. So it was like, they're kind of fun movie days. He says, in 2018, I saw 85 films in the cinema. This year, I've seen 13, all pre-lockdown. And we didn't feel uh, ready to return when Cineworld opened back up, and it's since, since closed down again, but they haven't been since. So Martin said they looked at adding a movie package to their TV subscription. Martin says, we're fairly confident we'd still be able to see the big releases with only a couple months or less delay. However... When we went to the cinema, we would use smaller films that sometimes we'd not heard of to fill up our day, you know, to get our money's worth. Although we hadn't heard of them, we'd enjoy seeing them and sometimes see really good films we would not have considered seeing otherwise. The downside to having the TV or on-demand service is we probably will miss out on those smaller films. We might not consider watching them because we're not in the theater wasting time. Although we have to consider the issue of distractions and going to the cinema forces us to put our phones away. So... Yeah, I think, you know, Martin, you're onto something. It's it's not the same. And it, it, you might be saving a lot of money, but uh, but yeah, it's it, you are building a new experience, not really replicating the old one. You know, it's inter it's an interesting thought that you, you won't run into movies at the theater if you're a regular theater goer, where you just show up and go, what's playing? Uh, but I think Netflix and HBO Max and, and those, those streaming services uh, and are going to be very good at showing you independent films that you wouldn't get exposed otherwise. Rob and I were talking about this before the show, actually. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff that just doesn't get made or you just never see it because the studios, they, they want to make profit. I mean, that, that's what they're there for. So you're going to see the big blockbusters. They know we spent a quarter billion dollars to make it. We need to make a billion dollars on it. As compared to if we spend 10 million to make it, then we need to make, you know, then we need to make 40. That's not necessarily making a move. So you just don't oftentimes see that kind of content. But if it's on these streaming services as as fill content, you know, you, you see a lot of good movies that, I mean, are really quality, uh, you know, stories, quality scripts, you know, good writing, all of that stuff that you would normally not be able to see by just going to the movie theater to see big box movies. Well, if you have emails for us, whether it's a personal story, as Martin sent it in, or a question or a comment, please send it along. Feedback 
at dailytechnewsshow.com. We also want to shout out our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Today, they include Justin Zellers, Miss Music Teacher, and Mike McLaughlin. Len Peralta has been busy illustrating uh, today's topics. Uh, actually, uh, one of the big topics of the week, Len, <laughs> that you drew here. Yeah, I am super excited for this. Uh, the big announcement about Warner Brothers taking their whole slate of movies to <laughs> HBO Max. Uh, this piece is called The Warners Are Here, and it depicts <laughs> an image of uh, someone opening up his door and uh, all these uh, huge monsters and the Dune Worm and, and Wonder Woman are all waiting to, to come on in. I, for one, am uh, all for it. And I hardly endorse bringing the Warners into my home for 2021. Uh, so, yeah, so you can get this uh, right now uh, if you're a Patreon subscriber, patreon.com forward slash Len. You can download it right now or you can go to my online store at lenperaltastore.com where I'm also selling uh, custom Christmas cards. So you can check it out. Check that out. It's right on the front page. Very cool. Len Peralta, do check those out. Also, thanks to Rob Dunwood for being with us today. Rob, where can people keep up with your work? I am all things at Rob Dunwood on whatever the platform is, but you can definitely check me out over on the smrpodcast.com website um, where you'll hear my weekly show. We want to send folks a holiday card. If you're a patron and you've given us your address by December 10th, you'll get one. Uh, you can check if we've got your address by going to patreon.com slash pledges, finding DTNS, and then looking in the right-hand column. You can either edit it to make it right, update it if it's not there, or just look at it and go, oh, no, nope, there it is. Uh, if you want the holiday card, though, you have to become a patron now at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. Hey, did you know we're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2130 UTC? Well, you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Thanks to everybody who does join us live. It is Friday, and guess what? We'll be back on Monday. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>